Hello, everybody. My name is Katherine Barron. I'm a longtime education reporter and host of The Score, a podcast about academic integrity and cheating. Over six episodes of The Score, we'll be looking at the landscape of cheating in school and delving into the key issues at play in this multifaceted issue challenging academia today. We'll ask the experts and students to provide insights into what's happening in our classrooms. How big a problem is it? Who cheats? Along with what policies, regulations, and changes in teaching and assessment show promise in curbing cheating. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at PodcastTheScore, one word, or stop by our website to download show notes and see our lineup of guests and release dates. We're at PodcastTheScore.com. Again, that's PodcastTheScore.com. On this episode of The Score, we're speaking with Dr. Amy Smith, a longtime leader in online learning and the chief learning officer at Straderline, which provides low-cost online college courses. Also with us is Dr. David Emerson, an associate professor of accounting in the Franklin P. Purdue School of Business at Salisbury University in Maryland. Dr. Emerson and his colleagues conducted groundbreaking research on the different motivations for cheating in school. Welcome to The Score. Dr. Smith, I'm gonna kick it off with you. You are definitely concerned about cheating. In your articles though, particularly one in Ed Surge and the Heckinger Report, you write that you don't see it solely as a problem with integrity among students. Uh, tell us what you see as the responsibilities that may often be lacking of the colleges and universities. Oh yeah, great question. So, you know, cheating is a, it's a multifaceted problem, right? And it's definitely an incredible challenge, particularly in hybrid and online space in higher education. I think universities recently are stepping up to, and they're leaning in to the fact that it's happening, that it is more prolific than maybe we ever really thought. And I also think that there are things universities can actually do about it. So on the one hand, students owe themselves and their own learning the responsibility to act with integrity. But the universities also are the educators of those students, right? So if we look at it from that lens, I think universities owe students clear expectations, definitions of what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable, what is actually considered cheating and what isn't. The second thing I think universities really owe those students are training and coaching to know and understand those expectations. It's one thing to set them out. It's another thing to ensure that students really understand the ins and the outs, what is and isn't cheating, what they can and can't do. And the third thing I think universities really owe students are accountability systems that are clear, that are well-defined, and that are consistent. We often see in the research and the literature shows us that a lot of times a faculty member, for all the right reasons, will help a student out or try to, to manage or monitor cheating and not really report it for a variety of reasons. I'm sure we'll get into that much throughout this podcast. But that also goes around uh, the actual accountability system the university sets up. So universities, different colleges, different majors, different uh, fields report incidents differently. And then that makes inconsistencies in the accountability. So if I'm a student and I don't know how I'm going to be held accountable, like what's going to happen to me, I don't make a fully informed choice when I do make choices of how to navigate my education. So I think universities owe students clarity of expectation, training and coaching around those expectations, and accountability systems that are also really clear. So a, a couple of follow-ups, but, but one is that what you just discussed, some of those issues are in the Student Bill of Rights that you helped draft. And one is, as you've been mentioned, one is this expectation that a student's work is presumed to be honest and accurate. And the other, also as you mentioned, is the right to review and understand the policies that keep a student from being disadvantaged by either not knowing what's, what the school's policies are or by the misconduct of other students. And in a way, these positions differ a bit from the conventional wisdom that students, <laughs> it seems to me, are presumed to be taking advantage of opportunities to cheat. And you're kind of flipping that around. Uh, am I reading into that correctly? <laughs> yeah, actually, thank you for noting. I am flipping it around. It, it sort of goes back to some of the 
the principles and the values of, of how we are as a democracy. We are absolutely innocent until proven guilty, right? Why doesn't that same premise apply in higher education, in student space, being a student? So we go from the idea, the thinking really is to assume students are doing the right thing. Uh, it doesn't mean you're not watching and monitoring and we don't have checks and balances for all of that, but we would all be hard pressed to challenge, to think that the millions of students in hybrid or online or even ground-based learning are, are cheating as their default because cheating really is an exception, not the rule. So yes, I am flipping that around. Thank you for asking. But before I get to Dr. Emerson, Dr. Smith, one more quick follow-up to this. Do students really not know what's right or wrong, or is it that they don't know what the college or university they attend thinks is right or wrong, or, or combination? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think with the advent of technology, is it right or wrong that I, I'm reading my chapter, but I check Google to look up a specific fact? Is that wrong? I mean, it is if I'm taking a test, but is it if I'm just studying? Is that actually cheating? Because I didn't actually read something in a textbook and I, I went online instead, right, to consult a different source. So I think technology has created marginally gray spaces that did not previously exist. So I definitely think it's, I think it's really both to answer your question. I'll be curious to see what Dr. Emerson thinks about that one though. So, especially because he really studies the student motivation and the student angle. Well, that's what we're gonna to go to right now. It's Dr. Emerson, your research seems to point in a different direction. Specifically, um, your new study with colleagues found that, it, this one in the Journal of Accounting Education, it, it found that there were several different elements that contributed to a student's decision to cheat. Could you briefly describe the framework that you use to predict cheating behavior? Sure, and uh, thank you for having me. Our research is premised on the notion that we wanna understand the cheating decision. And we're using the presumption that certain personality variables differentially affect different phases of that decision-making process. Now, specifically what we did is we took a model that was developed by some folks that were trying to model uh, consumer fraud behavior and applied it to the academic misconduct arena. So what we did is we looked at the, the constellation of personality traits known as the dark triad. These are psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism, each of which individually have been shown to have negative influences on a variety of outcomes, but in concert, they exert an influence greater than their individual pieces. And we then extrapolated those personality traits and modeled them onto what we call the fraud diamond. This is a decision-making process, ethical decision-making process formulated originally by Cressy in the early 1950s to model financial fraud. It was modified in the early 2000s to include an element called capability. So the, the fraud diamond includes the elements of motivation, opportunity, capability, and rationalization, with rationalization being the culmination of the other three pieces. And we hypothesized and found that each of the fraud uh, diamond elements is influenced by the dark triad elements in predictable ways. So could you give an example? So, Narcissism, for example, is related to capability and motivation. Capability and motivation are then related to rationalization, which then leads to the action of uh, the, what we were modeling is the use of uh, unauthorized use of homework assistance websites is what we are looking at specifically within the cheating realm. Uh, Machiavellianism, we found to be related to opportunity and motivation with, again, opportunity and motivation, again, being directly associated with rationalization and then the intention and action associated with the actual cheating behaviors. 
And psychopathy we found to be related to the motivation and directly related with rationalization, as well as related to intent. So let's say that we're looking at narcissism and I'm a, a narcissist. So what, what does that say about what I might do given the opportunity and why I might do that? Well, narcissism is characterized by a need for admiration, a sense of self-importance and grandiosity, uh, a preoccupation with fantasies of unlimited power, of uh, success and brilliance. So they're going to be motivated to engage in the opportunity, the fraudulent behavior, but they're also going to have a sense that their capabilities are greater as well. Whereas Machiavellianism has lack of empathy and belief that they're manipulating others for their own benefit is of use to them. So that'll exploit a wide range of duplicitous tactics in order to achieve the goals that they wish. So that's going to be directly associated with the opportunity. And psychopathy, psychopathy is one of the primary drivers of the, of the three elements of the dark triad. Psychopathy is really the one that is most difficult to guard against. And greedy risk-taking, deception, artificial charm, uh, manipulation, wide variety of misconduct type behaviors. So it's typified by a true lack of conscience. Whereas one author stated it as psychopaths know right from wrong, but they don't care. They're gonna do what is ever in their best interest, regardless of the outcomes. So the only way you're gonna stop a psychopath from cheating is by denying them the opportunity to do so. Right, so, so some of these, you have to take maybe much more draconian measures to prevent cheating in those cases. Uh, and plus you don't know who's who in the class, uh, but, but, but also in, more broadly, do you have a sense of what percentage of students fall into these categories and what percentage don't at all, that they're, you know, sort of ethical people with integrity and wouldn't do this? Okay, well, these are not dichotomous variables, right? These are all continuous variables. Everyone uh, exhibits some of these characteristics to one degree or another. I mean, true psychopaths represent less than 1% of the overall population. Uh, some researchers put the, that population at 3% in you know, upper level business, CEOs and such like that. And you know, since I'm an accounting professor, my research is aimed at business students. And you know, contrary to what Amy was stating, almost all students admit to cheating in one form or another to one degree or another. And once they've been able to rationalize the cheating decision once, it the damage is done, right? The, their probability of cheating again is extraordinarily high. And like I said, most students, a strong majority, uh, upwards of 90% in STEM studies, but very rarely do they find uh, anything less than 70% of students admit to cheating. And, and this is, you know, uh, an a admission against their own interests. And business students have been found to cheat more. I guess it, it sounds like you're saying that you know, this is just a part of our makeup. Um, and, and one of the reasons I ask is, you know, people might say, well, because of COVID and everything's online, there's an increase in cheating. And, and that appears to be true. But also cheating's been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, I've read that students cheated on the Chinese civil service exam hundreds of years ago. So does it mean that we're all wired to cheat? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. I mean, it, it's more than a thousand years ago. Oh, a thousand. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, six, seven hundred A.D. was the uh, initial recognition of cheating, and then you know, once higher education came into play in Oxford in the early eighteen hundreds, as soon as formalized uh, examinations came out, cheating was right hot on their heels. And it is human nature to a large extent, right? To act in your own best interest, to uh, maximize your utility regardless of the cost. Now, 
people have many different motivations for cheating. It may be just because they're lazy and they don't want to do it. Maybe they're uh, more interested in it because uh, the subject matter is too difficult. They don't think that anybody's harmed by it. Or maybe it's just because I'm not interested in the subject matter. It's never I'm never going to use it in my life, so why should I care? And it's therefore okay for me to cheat. So, Dr. Smith, you haven't actually found that those the numbers that high through the online courses offered by Straighter Line. Yeah, we haven't. So Straighter Line last year, uh, just last year alone, had about 45,000 students through a Straighter Line course. And of those 45,000 students, there are a couple of things we do, though. I'm going to agree with uh, David on a lot of it is preemptive. It's expectations that are really clear. We talked about and also accountability, consistently accountable systems that are relatively severe that the, as deterrence, right? What is your real deterrent? So let's talk about a little bit about deterrence. Let me expand on that. So take these 45,000 students. We have three things at Straighter Line that we set up to monitor or to prevent cheating. Like you just have to pre- try to prevent it. You just don't make it. I'm going to go back to Dr. Emerson's opportunity. You just don't make it opportunistic. It, it isn't available. One way we do that is everything you turn in at Straighter Line, you have, to, you have to turn in through turnitin.com. So we have a mechanism to check hey, is Amy's paper really Amy's? (laughs) Or or did Amy borrow Catherine's paper because it was a little bit better and submits, you know, she submitted Catherine's sections as her own. We definitely do that. The second thing we also do is all final exams are live proctored. I mean, your, your browser will shut down if there is any hint of suspicious behavior in any way while somebody's watching you take your exam. So that's the second part. And the third thing that we do at Straighter Line is there's actually a team in academics side of the house that watches um, postings, watches online constantly, like this is their job, right? This is what they do is make sure that Amy didn't decide to post a quiz somewhere online and then everybody's got the answers to a straighter line course. So we have preventative measures, which are the, we feel deterrence, but that doesn't always, it, you know, it, humans are humans. And that's actually what Dr. Emerson's talking about, that decision-making that really happens. I'll pause with that. Dr. Emerson, thoughts about what I just said? I agree completely. I mean, you're doing, sounds like you're doing everything right within the online arena, right? Is denying them that op- that opportunity. And like I said, we did find that these online real-time lockdown browsers and continuous monitoring uh, and proctoring of live exams it is going to be effective. Absolutely. I mean, the... Cheating behaviors I was referring to were unmonitored, unproctored. In the experiment that we did, when we implemented an online uh, proctoring service, the incidence of cheating went down 87%. It went down, it went from, you know, about half to down to about 5%. So it didn't eliminate it but it greatly reduced it because the problem is when you're using an online assessment integrity tool, it only works on the machine on which you're taking the assessment. There's no preclusion that prevents them from looking up the answer on a different device. Now you state that you're, that you're not finding straight line materials on other websites. Have you gone to Chegg? to look to see whether or not the answers are there. That's an exact classic example. This team that monitors that, that's one of the the things that they monitor 24 seven constantly, yes. That doesn't mean things don't get posted. Let me be super clear. Things actually do, like a couple, it was last year or two years ago, something ended up posted on a quiz and I wanna say a history class, don't quote me. Um, So it does happen, it absolutely does. And of course our job is to take it down immediately, right? And be monitoring so that immediate is really immediate or as quickly as we possibly can. Um, so yes, we do have a team, but it doesn't mean it's perfect either, right? That's, it's one mechanism, not the only mechanism. You both seem to have these programs where um, you can block things completely. And I, I actually didn't know that that was possible. How, how does that work? These are a fee-based auxiliary program that students sign up for, and it is part of the assessment. 
So when they go to take the assessment, um, in our case, it was offered by the publisher. And the publisher provides access to this integrity tool that allows us a wide variety of options. We can record their screen. We can record any websites they go to. We can block access to websites. We can record their microphone. If we wanted, you can also pay an additional fee to have an online somebody watching in real time. But these get very expensive very quickly. And it's also very intrusive, right? The, the students don't like it because it starts with a presumption, like Amy was saying, that everybody's cheating. Well, they are, <laughs> to a large extent. If, it's, if you're taking a class, especially if it's a class you don't care about very much, and your, your professor gives you a quiz you know, directly out of the publisher's textbook, you know, out of their test bank, and you go online and take it. If you're able to just copy that answer or question out, go over to your browser, go to Chegg.com, and instantaneously the correct answer is there. You know, in many times from my publisher, I found the exact question with the with a test bank identifier attached to it, and with the correct answer immediately displayed. So one way to ameliorate that is to de-identify, right? Camouflage those questions. Change the name of, rather than uh, Amy's Flower Shop, which is given in the, the program, uh, use Harry Potter uh, had a flower shop. I found that using uh, popular references to pop culture seemed to confuse the algorithm quite a bit, get, provides way too many responses. Even Chegg can't get it. So you know, actively de-identify the questions that you are using or create your own questions. Use essay questions, right? Where, you know, especially in my advanced accounting class, I can break questions that you can look all day. You're never going to find the answers to the questions that I'm asking you. So good luck with that. Waste all the time that you're, the, 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 <laughs> the time you have available to take you trying to find the answer online. I guarantee you'll be unsuccessful. Well, I love this idea of using kind of pop culture references because you put that in and there'll be a million different hits and you just don't know where to go. Um, in a way, it's also kind of sad that that's what we've come to. I, I, I think, um, Dr. Smith, I wanted to bring some of this up because you are concerned about student privacy and that they're aware of what they're signing up for here. And I'm wondering you know, what, what are your thoughts on this? Is it okay as long as students absolutely understand what, what the, the testing, you know, proctoring company or testing company is, is going to be watching? Universities, you know, have a responsibility to explain and make sure students understand what they're signing up for and doing, particularly like if they're live proctoring, right, taking an exam live and it's being observed. So it's actually being live proctored. And that's part of the university's responsibility to the student. But the student also has a right to know what's happening with their, his or her or their data. Uh, and that also is the responsibility of the university to let, to confirm and let students know that the data isn't, it, FERPA laws still apply, the data isn't in use by a third party and identifiable, it's not identifiable data. That's part of really scrubbing for, if you do use a third party, such as a Proctor U, for example, that's part of your responsibility as a university. Anytime you add any third party or vendor, even uh, Dr. Emerson was speaking about um, a publisher, right? That's part of their work as well. So anytime I'm, as a student, I'm accessing uh, licensed publishing materials in a hybrid or online setting, or even my ground-based course, the, you know, the web materials, I need to know where my data is going. So the positive is data security and data privacy from ed technology, publishing houses, et cetera. The industries that serve higher education is, is paramount, is top of mind, and is very 
I'm going to use the good housekeeping seal of approval. It's very, very important. Like that's the first question any university asks on the table. And that's the first assurance any company will be able to demonstrate and, and make sure that a university is comfortable. So it's, it's sort of industry standard right now, to be honest. Does, does the straighter line have a policy that all students are aware of about what happens if you're caught cheating? Mm -hmm. Yep. We have academic integrity policies, just like a university has academic integrity policies. And we have an escalated process for if a student is caught and what that ultimate reporting and process is. And it, you know, it has just like any university, it has due process to it uh, from a student's rights perspective. But yes, it's uh, right up front at the very beginning of your class. It's very, very apparent. Now, I know that we've talked a bit about, you know, what we're doing to curb cheating in terms of using these different technological uh, fixes or, uh, you know, efforts. Is there a way to create a, a culture where education is about learning and gaining knowledge, conversations, classes on ethics, perhaps, that could start to move us in that direction so that even though maybe we all have that some some of those traits that say I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity that you know that the angel on the other shoulder says yeah you could do that but it's not the right thing to do. What we believe is that each of the phases of the ethical decision making framework, uh, which is the fraud diamond, opportunity motivation and rationalization can be targeted to help minimize the cheating behaviors by emphasizing those aspects of the decision-making process to minimize ultimate cheating. So, so does that mean that you can change maybe not people's, you know, internal um, motivations or characteristics, but perhaps how they encourage them to sort of, um, you know, put those on the back burner <laughs> for a while. Um, you know, I just wonder if it's immutable. Yeah, that, that's a big part of it. I mean, the, the dark triad, the personality traits are immutable, right? They're not very unlikely to change, as is capability. Capability is one's perception that they have the abilities and skills to take advantage of opportunities that are available to them. But motivation, every student is gonna have motivation to cheat in one way or another, right? I mean, everybody wants grades, everybody wants to be successful, they wanna get a good job, uh, they wanna be liked and admired by their peers. So there's a wide variety of motivations to it. And you hit on one of them is they're, whether they're intrinsically or extrinsically motivated. If, they, if you can change their motivational focus to something that uh, resembles, this is my own best interest. I need to learn this because it's important to me. So if you can change their focus, then they'll recognize that cheating is not of a benefit to me. Even if I get the grade, if I don't know it, I'll be proven to be a dummy uh, when I get to my job and I'm not going to be able to keep my job because I don't have the requisite skills and abilities that my transcript says that I have. Right, because it does seem like accounting is one of those fields where if you cheat your way through, you're going to get caught because at some point you'll have a job and you just won't know how to do the work and you, you can't fake it. That is exactly true. But other than that, you know, one of the ways to uh, decrease their motivations to cheat is to counter the incentives that are provided through disincentives, right? This, the cheating decision is made under the presumption that it's a rational calculus of what do I get as a result of this activity versus what are the costs if I'm caught? So one of the ways you can disincentivize this activity is to make sure that there is a heavy cost for every incidence of academic misconduct, regardless of the level of severity. 
So if they know what is expected of them, right? If it goes to Amy's point that they have to be acutely aware of these are the rules. And if you break those rules, you are going to be harshly and swiftly punished to the point that it is a disincentive that you do not want to pay. And I make this very clear to my students on day one. If you cheat and I catch you, not only will you be tossed out of the class, not only will you receive an F on, the tra on your transcript, that F on your transcript will never go away. It will be a permanent F, so that 0.0, .0 will be there in your GPA calculation for the rest of your college career. Now, I do not want to do this. It is a royal pain to go through the, the process to charge someone with academic misconduct, but it is the only thing, you know, based on lots of research, that a harsh, severe, and certain negative outcome works, but you have to be consistent in applying it across all students, regardless of level and regardless of the level of severity. And I've had, you know, more than one student removed from the university. So Dr. Emerson, now you talked about what you do in your class. Is that university wide? Well, Within the academic integrity policy that we do have, the professor is allowed a significant leeway on what sanctions they want to impose. So uh, it's a very specific um, process to report somebody for academic misconduct. And you know, I, I state it several times in my syllabus and I recommend that all professors do this. Right. Make very clear what is cheating, what resources are allowed. Is it OK to work together on homework, but not on quizzes? Sure. Yeah. I, I want students to collaborate on lots of things. People learn better many times in groups than they do when you're undergoing a formal assessment. And I make that clear. You know, but my expectations are that this is an individual work. I expect you to do this alone. I expect you not to have any outside resources. Again, the professor determines the level of severity of the sanction, right? I mean, you can just slap them on the wrist. We're not going to do anything. You get a zero for the assignment. Now, in my defense, I guess there's been a couple of circumstances when I did not throw them out of the class and give them a permanent F on their transcript but I put the fear of God into them, and I'm pretty sure that it's never that behavior was never repeated again. So, yeah, but you absolutely need to be very clear in your syllabus what your expectations are. I mean, my syllabus has links directly to the academic integrity policy of the university as well as that of the business school. And at least in the school of business, there is no... A gray area as to what we consider academic misconduct. And, and does that seem to um, reduce cheating in your classes when the other students see what the repercussions are? Well, it's that's hard to say. One would hope, right? Because, I mean, one, one of the ways that, you know, academic honor codes work is through peer pressure. If you can inculcate a culture where cheating is not acceptable, then presumably peers will disincentivize them from engaging in that activity. But people are always going to be motivated. Uh, they want that diploma. They want the rewards that go with an education, but they don't want to work for it. Uh, they will do whatever they need to do. And this is especially true, you know, more on the psychopathic end of the spectrum where they're there maybe because their parents want them to be there. They, they don't have that intrinsic motivation. You know, we can try the best that we can to, to inculcate that type of culture, but you're never going to be completely successful. I mean, regardless of how hard you try, 
especially if everybody else does it, right? If other students are engaging in this unethical behavior, the other students, the, the ethical ones, are being left behind. They're, they're suffering from grade deflation because everybody's harmed by academic misconduct. The students don't, aren't getting the knowledge that they need. The students that aren't cheating are suffering from grade deflation. The institution is suffering from uh, reputational effects. The community is suffering because their professionals that they think are highly skilled and trained aren't. Mm -hmm. it's, it is maddening for students, I would think, if you're studying very hard and you, you can't really get the, the grades you want or think you're entitled to because other people have, have ruined the curve, essentially, by cheating. Uh, Dr. Smith, uh, uh, what, what do you do at Straighter Line in addition to the technological um, efforts? Are, are there classes, are there conversations that every student has with somebody at the, the straighter line to say, this is, this is exactly what we're expecting from you? Yeah, it's a great question. So we actually, a little bit, of, a little bit about it uh, is relative to course design. So I promise I'm not going to take us down a rabbit hole, but course, how you design a course, Dr. Emerson mentioned his syllabus, for example, and the links he has on it to policy, how you design a course really matters. So the student voice survey, the October student voice survey came out. It was just recently published in Inside Higher Ed um, so a few weeks ago. They surveyed 2,000 undergrads, and they actually were talking about academic integrity, cheating. And so they got the voice of the student around this. And what I find interesting was 52% of those students believed the reason they may be tempted to cheat was because the course expectations were too high. The class was too hard. It was too rigorous. It required too much work. So how you design a class and the navigation through a course and the amount of work, it matters. But it also there's the other side of that. You need a rigorous enough class where you really do master the outcomes so that when you take that 100 and go to a 200 level, you're really ready in that discipline, right? You actually, as Dr. Emerson has said, you've actually really learned the content and the material and the skills uh, of that course. The other interesting uh, data point in this particular survey was 72% of the students in this survey believed that pressure to do well was one of the key variables in why they might consider cheating or not. So course design and the pressure to do well. So what do we do at Strider Line? Back to your original question. Course design really matters for us, but course design is the content of the class and how you navigate through it and how much work it is, but it's also the support systems, right? So this same survey said 43% of the students said that I know how to get help. I know how to go to a professor or to talk to advising or get tutoring. I know how to get help while I'm learning. So that's one of the things Strider Line does is there are the preventative measures we do, but there are also a really robust set of 24 seven, literally student supports, it's 24 seven. You can get tutored in physics midnight on Saturday if you want to, you really can, by the way. Uh, you can also take your exam 6 a.m. on a Monday if you feel like it before you go to work, whatever you actually really need. But we have uh, advisors Sunday through Sunday and night hours to help you with time management and just challenges of being a student. We have tutoring in every content for all of our courses for every subject area and a live person uh, any day of the week at any moment that you may need it. But we also have coaching and right time coaching to help you just navigate learning how to be a student, right? You can talk to a live person. So for us, giving you the right supports so you know a how to find them and that they're there when you need them gives you the helping hand as a student to actually really do that learn the learning learn the content of the course and the skills that's really important to us so some preventative like we had discussed in the technology but also how we design the learning experience for a student helps a student be a student and then hopefully you won't need to cheat and you have supports that matter when you need them I hope that answers your question, though. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and so, Dr. Emerson, what would be your you know suggestion to colleges and and universities to try to you know work with students to to get them to see the 
not just the, the pitfalls of cheating, but to see the harm that it causes and to themselves and society and their, their value of their degrees. Sure. Ethics classes have been shown to have some efficacy, but the problem that we have there is, is there room in the course curriculum to allow an extra class? Amy had a very good suggestion or process that they go through, give many different ways to learn. I provide close to a hundred uh, videos that are available to them for different things. We have tutoring. I have a supplemental instructor to the class who gives additional uh, two extra classes a week outside of our normal class time where Many times students feel more comfortable uh, going with an up, upper graduate or upper level student who's already had the class and done well, uh, working with them for their problems. Uh, I offer extended office hours and can speak with them really almost any time that they want. The most powerful tool an instructor has is the design of the course itself. So providing many different ways to learn. You know, reading, videos, uh, PowerPoints that are available to them outside of, I hate to teach by PowerPoints. I don't think it's an effective uh, learning tool, but some people learn better using PowerPoint. So I make them all available to the student if they want. You know, so a wide variety of different ways to learn the material, try to make it clear why the material is important to them and their lives and their future careers. It's many times the only way to you know, minimize their motivation, minimize their opportunities, and ultimately minimize their ability to rationalize that academic misconduct. Thank you both for joining us on The Score. Our guests today are Dr. Amy Smith, longtime leader in online learning and the chief learning officer at Straighter Line, and Dr. David Emerson, an associate professor of accounting in the Franklin P. Purdue School of Business at Salisbury University in Maryland. I'm Katherine Barron. You've been listening to The Score. The Score is produced by the Academic Integrity and Research Group at Pando Public Relations. It is underwritten by Measure Learning and technical support is provided by This Is Distorted. To ask questions, to download show notes, or to learn more about The Score, visit our website at podcastthescore.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at at podcastthescore or find us on all the podcast platforms as The Score.